Good morning, students. This lecture will be about the formation of the fetal membranes, the decidue, and about the placentation. Here you see a, a fetus about in the fourth month. Uh, there you see the umbilical cord connecting to the placenta. And this is the amnion, and the amniotic cavity is filled with the amniotic fluid. Of course, this is a preparation after an abortion, so it's an artificial fill-up of the amnionic sac. And this is here a picture of a placenta, a piece of a placenta, where this shining layer on the surface, that's the amnion. There you see the umbilical vessels as they reach the placenta or coming, come back from the placenta. And what's interesting for, uh, with this is once that you see here the ruptured edge of the amnion, and you see two umbilical cords. Occasionally, uh, placentas of twins, they fuse. We will learn about that in the last lecture. And in this case, that was interesting that these two were connected with a blood vessel. And this may lead to fetal fetal transfusion, which may cause them problems in the development of these twin babies. So, uh, what about the fetal membranes? What are the fetal membranes? You have seen this series of pictures already earlier when we told about the flexion. And the gray territories are the embryo. Here only the trilaminar germ disc and then the flexion happens and there you have an embryo already with, in this region, the heart primordium. But now we will examine that what is in the surrounding. You see that the amnion, this yellow layer, will more and more pull down during the flexion, and at the end it will cover uh, the structures in the umbilical cord, which will be the York sac. Here you have the vitelline duct and the York sac, and the allantois. And this will be the inner fetal membrane, the amnion. The outer fetal membrane, we call it the chorion. And from these pictures you can read that what are the layers of this chorion, because first we will have uh, the central extramionic mesodermal layer. This is here the somatopleura covering the amnion. Then the next layer will be the peripheral extramionic mesoderm. Then, come the uh, then comes the cytotrophoblast layer, and then the syncytiotrophoblast. This extracellomic cavity will disappear due to the fusion of these two extramionic mesodermal layers, and together we call it then the chorion mesoderm. So the chorion layer itself that consists of this chorionic mesoderm, has to had two sublayers sub originally, then the cytotrophoblast and then the syncytiotrophoblast. Uh, where are we now in the female cycle? As the blastocyst appear, uh, arrives to the uterine cavity, uh, the cycle is about on the 20th day. This is the so-called secretional phase after the ovulation, and the uterine mucosa turns into a very nutritive phase, uh, giving the possibility that if a fertilized oocyte in the form of blastocyst arrives, then uh, after embedding it would get enough nutrition. How does it look like? Uh, we have the myometrium. On the myometrium we have the endometrium. The endometrium has a basal layer. This doesn't change and it's not uh, discarded during the menstruation. So uh, this will provide the regeneration. But above the glands, this will form the so-called functional layer. Functional, the word refers to that, that this layer will change uh, during the cycle. And here we have very dilated glands. This form here, the spongy part. And on the surface, we have these patches of cells, which are more compact. And due to this, we call it the stratum compactum. In the stratum compactum, in the second half of the cycle, already changes happen, because in the first part, you have here the spinocellular connective tissue, which was mentioned uh, during the types of connective tissues. This is a cell-rich connective tissue with a lot of fusiform elongated cells. But in the second half of the cycle, the cell cells will start to round up, and they will get closer to each other. These will uh, form these more compact looking patches, and that's why we call this later layer stratum compactum. Uh, this is how it looks in the secretory phase. Also, we do not know yet whether pregnancy will follow or not, but the cells, they are somewhat rounded already. And if there is a 
implantation, then this process is going on, and from these cells we will get the decidual cells. So decidual cells are also connective tissue cells. The decidual itself is also a cell-rich connective tissue with the special decidual cells formed from the spinocellular connective tissue cells. There are big bubble-shaped uh, cells with a pale cytoplasm since they contain a lot of glycogen. The uterus, so to say, doesn't know where the implantation will happen. So this decidual reaction will start everywhere around uh, the uterus. That part of the decidua, which is right underneath the embedded embryo, we call it the basal decidua. This will form uh, the maternal part of the placenta. Uh, the region which is, so to say, covering the back of this embedded blastocyst, that will be the capsular decidua. That's a very thin layer. And the rest of the decidua will form the parietal decidua. For a while, we have here a gap yet between the capsular decidua and the parietal decidua. Uh, but as the uterus grows, then this will disappear because the capsular decidua and the parietal decidua, they will fuse with each other. In the region of the basal decidua, the, plac uh, the placenta will form, and the placenta will form from the chorion frondosum, that's marked here with gray color. This is the bushy chorion. And this is here the smooth chorion in the other regions, but only this bushy chorion, the chorion frondosum, will take part in the formation of the placenta. Uh, mark also the growth of the uterus. The uterus is quite a small organ. It's smaller than you imagine because it's only seven centimeters long before uh, the uh, pregnancy. And during the pregnancy it grows a lot, but after the pregnancy soon, within uh, six weeks, it shrinks back again to uh, its almost original size, so it will remain around eight centimeters, the total length of the uterus. The wall of the uterus, the myometrial wall, that's very thick at the beginning, it's about two centimeters thick, but as the uterus grows, then it will be thinner and thinner. So at the end of the pregnancy, it's already uh, only a few millimeters, it's not, uh, not two centimeters already. But even so, there is a big uh, proliferation of the smooth muscle cells, and it's also in number and in size that we call uh, then uh, hyperplasia and hypertrophia. So that's how you may get 500 micrometer long smooth muscle cells in the wall of the uterus, of the pregnant uterus only. Now, what's the situation so, uh, 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 shortly before birth? Then the baby is with head downward. Right? And around the baby, the cavity, the amniotic cavity that's full, full, filled with the amniotic fluid, that's about one liter. And the umbilical cord is covered by the amnion. And the amnion makes also this big sac, this big bubble in which the baby is floating in the amniotic fluid. This is the inner fetal membrane, the yellow line. Around this yellow line, you have this blue territory. The blue territory shows the position of the chorion. This is here the, uh, the smooth chorion territory. And from the fro uh, chorion frondosum in this region, you get the fetal placenta. Next to the chorion, uh, to the uh, smooth chorion, this pinkish layer, that is the decidua layer of the uterus. That's the parietal decidua. And you have here also a, de a decidua layer. Uh, as a part of the placenta, this will form the maternal side of the placenta. This is here the umbilical cord, which contains the vessels also. Here, uh, on this sketch, only uh, the vitaline duct and the remnant of the vitaline sac and the allantois is shown. So here the vessels are not drawn into this picture. And here is the umbilical ring. At the level of the umbilical ring, the amnion will meet the body surface of the baby. And you know that the body surface of the baby, that comes from the ectoderm, and the surface layer, it's a stratified squamous keratinizing epithelium. There is a very sharp line here between these two tissues. We will see it on a later picture. As I told you, the amniotic cavity is filled by the amniotic fluid. The amount of it can be examined you, uh, during ultrasound examination, and it's a sign for certain diseases, also if it's less and also if it's more 
uh, than normal. Now, how does the placentation happen? Uh, previously, we showed already once these pictures, but now let's look through them one more time and concentrate on exactly on the changes. Uh, so, as I told you, uh, on the surface of this embedded blastocyst, which is facing the depths of the uterine mucosa, the chorion and, the, and these villi, the, they will grow faster. This will be here, the chorion frondosum. And the other side will be underdeveloped soon these lacunae will also uh, disappear, and that will be the chorion leve or smooth chorion. Here you also see the bilaminar germ disc, the amniotic sac, the yolk sac, the exosolemic cyst, the central axolemic mesoderm, connecting stoke mesoderm, peripheral mesoderm, and the cytotrophoblast and outermost layer. In this phase, it's yet the syncytiotrophoblasts. So here now, we have the lacunae, and in the lacunae we have interstitial fluid, and on the second week, on the, in the first half of the second week, uh, the, uh, the baby is fed with, these, uh, with this uh, interstitial fluid, which sneaks into these gaps in the syncytial trophoblasts. At the beginning of the third week, there are some changes, because to these lacunae, the maternal blood vessels will break in, so this is the so-called uteroplacental circulation. And also you may see that the cytotrophoblasts here, they will grow into the septa of syncytiotrophoblasts. So if you make a cross-section of these septa, in, or we may call them primitive villi, at this phase, then in the middle we have the cytotrophoblasts, and on the external surface we have the syncytiotrophoblasts. A few days later, uh, there are other changes. The extra embryonic mesoderm starts to contain these blood islets. Blood islets will form first in the extra embryonic mesoderm. Why? Because we don't have yet intra embryonic mesoderm. We need the gastrulation to get started, to have mesoderm inside the baby, and to have blood, islet, blood islets inside the baby. But this is not the only change, these blood islets, but also this chorionic mesoderm, this will also grow into these septa plus the, uh, the cytotrophoblasts, the light uh, green colored cytotrophoblasts, will go through the septa and will flow out onto the maternal surface. So as you see here, initially the syncytiotrophoblasts were in contact with the maternal tissues, but at the end of the third week, the cytotrophoblasts will be in contact uh, with the maternal tissues, and we call these extravillus trophoblasts. These extravillus trophoblasts are very important because they ensure the proper fixation and function of the placenta. So if these extravillus trophoblasts don't function well, then placental insufficiency may happen and uh, there may be, it may be followed by an abortion, a spontaneous abortion. Uh, you also see that these blood islets, they fuse and a closed blood vessel circulation is established at the end of the third week. And by the end of the third week, first day of the fourth week, inside the embryo, these blood islets also fused, and a primitive heart tube is formed, and it's pumping the blood around. We have now the villi inside the closed system of the, of the uh, embryonic uh, blood vessel system, and around the villi, we have the freely flowing maternal blood. Yeah, here you see first these extra embryonic blood islets, and later, when the gastrulation starts at the, in the second half of the third week, also the intraembryonic blood islets will form. And then the heart tube forms. This is here the dorsal aorta, and this heart tube will start to pump the blood around through the dorsal aorta, through the umbilical arteries, it goes to the placenta. Here it gets oxygen and nutrients, and through the umbilical vein, it will flow backward to the baby. How do these villi change during the pregnancy? First, we have all the layers that we can uh, deduct from the establishment of the placenta. So in the middle, we have the chorionic mesoderm with the blood vessels. Around it, we have the, uh, the uh, cytotrophoblasts. And on the external layer, uh, you have the syncytiotrophoblasts. These are the anchoring villi here, and 
the bottom of this anchoring villi is closed by a, a group of uh, cytotrophoblasts, but the cytotrophoblasts, they also spread out to the maternal uh, surface because this makes here the cytotrophoblast shell. From the fourth month, uh, the layers uh, will uh, start to be less. We don't have a continuous layer of, of cytotrophoblasts, and the vessels, as you will see, they will be more close to the, uh, to the external surface of the villi. Uh, these first order villi, they will form the so-called stem villi. The stem villi connect uh, directly to the placenta, to the fetal uh, side of the placenta. And then a secondary and tertiary arborization uh, will appear. This is the floating villi. They will float in the maternal blood. The maternal blood is not depicted here on this picture, but all around this villi, we would have maternal blood flowing around. In all languages, uh, if they have their own word for the placenta, it refers to some kind of a cake or pizza or something like this. So here now you see a slice of this cake of, of uh, the placenta. And here up you would have the amniotic fluid. The uh, umbilical cord would connect from this direction uh, to the placenta. And then this next layer is the fetal side of the placenta, which is made by the chorionic plate. So you have here the chorionic mesoderm, you have cytotrophoblasts, and you have syncytiotrophoblasts. This drawing shows the placenta in that phase, when the cytotrophoblast layer is already not continuous, but you still have visible patches here from it. Uh, the vessels that you see here are the fetal vessels. Uh, the arteries uh, are bringing the, uh, the deoxygenated blood from the baby, and the veins will drive it back uh, to the baby as oxygenized blood and containing nutrients. From, these, from this chorionic plate, the villi uh, will hang down. Some of the villi, they reach uh, the maternal surface. Those are the anchoring villi. And you see here the floating villi. Between the villi, the territories, we call it the intervillus space. The intervillus space is filled with maternal blood. On the other side, there is the so-called basal plate. And the basal plate has a fetal side. This is here the fetal side. The first layer is the syncytiotrophoblast. Then you have the cytotrophoblast. And then you have a fibrin layer. Right? And under the fibrin layer comes the maternal part of the placenta, which is the decidua. As I told you, the decidua will be formed from the spinocellular connective tissue cells of the uterine mucosa. The fibrin is an excellent glue. It fixes together the fetal and the maternal parts of the, of the uh, placenta. This big arrow shows uh, the, the uh, level where the placenta will shed uh, after the delivery. The placenta is born about 30 minutes after the delivery. Again, contractions of the uterus happen and the placenta detaches and it's born. And what remains in the uterus, that's the basal layer of the embryo endometrium. Uh, right after birth, in the basal layer, of course, the basal layer is very much stretched, uh, stretched out. So the original basal parts of the glands, they are standing very far from each other. But as I told you, with this very special metabolic process and apoptosis, this big mass of the, of the pregnant uterus will be built down. And with this, also, these basal uh, parts of the glands get closer to each other, and it will allow the regeneration of the uterine mucosa with glands and surface epithelium. And this will give the possibility that when also the hormonal background allows, then new ovulation happens and again another second or third or whatever pregnancy may follow. Uh, of course, this basal layer of the, of the endometrium that will be connected to the myometrium here below. This picture shows actually the same as what you saw in the previous picture. There you have the amnion, the chorionic plate, the villi, and the uh, basal plate. And here's the myometrium. Why I put this into the uh, series of pictures here, because here you see these little knots. You see here, 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 here. What are these? These are the so-called syncytial knots. 
syncytial knots are uh, the old cell nuclei from this syncytium of the syncytiotrophoblast. Syncytium means that it's, they, they are few cells, there are no cell borders there in between. And the, and the old cell nuclei are extruded from the surface with a, just a little cytoplasm along, uh, around. These are quite big structures and they will float here in the maternal blood. What can they do? They can flow away with the maternal veins to the inferior vena cava that goes to the right atrium. From there it goes to the right ventricle. From the right ventricle it goes to the lungs. And in the lungs, of course, they cannot pass through the capillaries of the lung. But in the lungs, uh, the macrophages, the special macrophages of the lung, uh, will eliminate them uh, from the maternal circulation. The immunology of the pregnancy, that's a very interesting uh, case, uh, because these cells, these are actually not uh, cells which are similar to the mother cells. So the baby may have a different blood group, it may have different uh, hist uh, histological uh, characteristics, genetically also, and it's a miracle that these tissue pieces from the baby, uh, they don't make any uh, immunological complications. Of course, these are not from the baby, but the genetic material is the same as it is in the baby. With this picture, I would like to summarize the nutrition of the embryo and then of the fetus during the uh, pregnancy. Actually, it starts already a little bit earlier in the ovary. There is the follicle, so this is here a graphian follicle. Please note that this is very similar to the blastocyst, but it's a very different structure. So this is here in the, in the ovary of the female. There is the cumulus ophorus with the oocyte. There are the granulosa cells around. And this oocyte, which is quite a big cell, needs also nutrition and some factors which influences the maturing of this oocyte, and these are in the follicular fluid. When this is ovula uh, ovulated, then the oocyte is released into the uterine tube, may, where it may be fertilized, and it may form the murula and also the blastocyst, and it travels in the direction of the uterus. At the end of the first week, it will start its embedding, and it is fed by diffusion. You know that somewhat later in the cytotrophoblast the lacunae will appear and then the uteroplacental circulation starts, which provides already somewhat, a somewhat better uh, nutrition. And at the end of the third week, the fetal vessels will be formed, right? And the blood will be pumped around and the villi are floating freely in the maternal blood. Uh, there are also the placental septa. The placental septa uh, are elevations from the, uh, from the basal plate. And we know that the basal plate that consists of the decidual cells, the fibrin, the cytotrophoblast, and the syncytiotrophoblast. And imagine it like in old ages with big earthquake as, as the big mountains were formed that all layers of the earth's crust were, are, are, are lifting up. And uh, in, this, in this placental receptor, you may have all these layers. So in the middle, you have usually a core of, of fibrin, and then you have cytotrophoblasts, syncytiotrophoblasts, even sometimes the decidual cells may swim into this placental receptor. Now, this placental receptor first will surround uh, one original uh, anchoring villus. But as the pregnancy proceeds, then the septa will be also more complicated, so they will have also several outgrowths. You will see this in the next semester when you see the histology of the placenta. And these original, uh, these original septa, they surround a unit of the placenta, what we call a cotyledon. According to the first stem villi, we have about 15 to 20 of these anchoring uh, villi. Uh, there you see the fetal vessels. The bl blue colored ones are the arteries. They bring the used blood, the oxygenated blood, and the one red one demonstrates here uh, the umbilical vein, which carries the fresh blood back to the baby. I could 
compare these cotyledons to buns. You know, there are some breads where, which consists actually of more buns, and you can break down individually these buns. So on the maternal surface, you see these bun-like elevations uh, due to these uh, cotyledons. After birth, it's very important to examine the maternal side of the placenta. Uh, because if a piece is missing, a cotyledon is missing, that's very dangerous. It may be followed by a, a very serious maternal disease, which is called disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. And the other interpretation for these three letters, like DIC in English, maybe death is coming. So this other interpretation shows that this is really a very dangerous uh, situation. Uh, with this picture, I would like to explain you the placenta barrier, that what are the layers through which the diffusion happens. So initially, the placenta barrier that consists of all possible layers. So if we start from the lumen of the blood vessel, then we have the fetal endothelium, we have a basement membrane, we have the chorionic mesoderm, we have an other basement membrane for the cytotrophoblasts, and we have on the outermost layer the syncytial trophoblast. Uh, as the pregnancy proceeds, the continuous layer of the uh, cytotrophoblast disappears, and the possible la least layers are that if the blood vessel is pressed to the side already uh, to the, of these uh, uh, villi, then you have the endothelial cell, you have a fused basement membrane, uh, a common basement membrane with the syncytial trophoblast and the syncytial trophoblast. Of course, sometimes it may happen that there is also chorionic mesoderm in between. Please note that there is no direct connection uh, between the blood vessels uh, of the baby and the maternal blood. The ma blood vessels of the baby are a closed system and the maternal blood is free freely flowing around these chorionic villi. The baby is fed by diffusion and not by transfusion. Please remember this. Now, what about the characteristics of the placenta? The placenta is 20, 25 centimeter in diameter. It's about the size of a plate size pizza, uh, five to 600 grams and three centimeter thick. It has 15 to 20 cotyledons the fetal side is covered by the amnion, and the mater side is, maternal side is covered by the placenta materna. Uh, the decidua doesn't come out fully right after birth. It will yet leak out, flow out for about two weeks, and that, that special secretion is called then the lochia. Uh, the umbilical vessels may reach the placenta in the middle, or somewhat eccentric, this doesn't make any difference. But occasionally, there is a so-called velamentous insertion. Velamentous insertion is uh, if the umbilical cord doesn't pull to the placenta, but it pulls to the wall of the amniotic sac. And from this point, then rays of vessels go in the direction of the placenta. And since usually the birth starts with rupturing of the membranes, then the amniotic membrane also will get ruptured. This rupture line may go through these vessels. And if a vessel like this is ruptured, that may cause a big fetal bleeding and fetal blood loss. And that's a dangerous situation. I will show you later a picture about this velamentous insertion. What is the role of the placenta? I used to say that this is kind of a joke that I summarize in, in these few words, but now we don't have more time for it, and you will learn about this later in uh, obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, it, the role is the transport of metabolites and gases to the baby and from the baby. It produces a lot of hormones, many others also, not only these what I listed here, but these ones you must remember. HCG, we already mentioned, that's the human chorionic gonadotropin, which uh, is in effect similar to LH. Human placenta lactogen, progesterone and estrogen, these are all produced by the placenta. And the placenta has this important function uh, as a barrier. I showed you the layers, the diffusion layers in the previous 
pictures, and this barrier means that some, some materials are, uh, can freely enter the fetal circulation and others not. Uh, this is sometimes good that they enter and it's sometimes bad. Of course that the nutrients and the oxygen enters the baby, that's a good thing. That's also a good thing that the maternal antibodies, they also enter uh, the fetal circulation because this is how the babies uh, who are born, they have the same immunity against diseases as the mother had for about six months after birth. So these are good things. But it's not good, not good thing that the uh, rubeola virus goes also, for example, through this barrier, and that may cause a fetal malform malformation. And the, the, this uh, barrier, this functions also in the other layer, other direction. Uh, of course, it's good that the metabolites of the baby and the carbon dioxide may go to the maternal blood. But for example, also the insulin will go through from the baby to the mother. And it's typical for diabetic mothers that they have a larger baby because the baby will help the mother with insulin. Uh, because the baby's system feels that the mother needs some more insulin. So diabetics usually need le less external insulin uh, from the second trimester on. But this extra insulin production, this is a growth factor, so it makes the baby larger, which is not very good. So doctors are not very happy with a 5 kg baby, baby from an, uh, and a diabetic mother. And uh, the baby may have complications after uh, birth uh, due to uh, this overshooting of the insulin and, and uh, ha may have problems with the uh, uh, blood glucose level regulation. So this functions then this barrier in both directions. Uh, you will hear about this later in physiology and in obstetrics. Some other pictures about the topic, drawings where you see the fetal side of the placenta, umbilical cord, here you have the amnion, here the amnion is removed and only the blood vessels uh, are here. This is the other side, this is the maternal side of the, of the placenta where you have the uh, these units, these bun-shaped units, these are the cotyledons. And here you see the baby in the position ready to be born with head downward. And here is the placenta and the umbilical cord. These are two pictures of the fetal side, amnion, fetal vessels, am uh, amniotic cord. And here is the ruptured amnion at the edge. And this is the other side of this placenta and these units are the cotyledons. This is a baby about at the end of the second month. Uh, there you see the limbs, the head is already shaping, the umbilical cord and the placenta and the amniotic sac is filled up. Of course, this is uh, not a natural uh, photo, not in situ photo, but it's an abortion baby photo. And th this is the, that uh, vel uh, uh, velamentous insertion. So you see that the umbilical cord reached here uh, the amnion, here you see the ruptured amnion, and as raised, then the blood vessels will run into the placenta. This doesn't cause any problems until the membranes are not ruptured, but upon rupturing, then a vessel may be broken due to the rupturing of the membranes. Sometimes the uh, length of the umbilical cord allows that a baby, if a baby is too active, then the baby itself will tie a knot onto the umbilical cord. These knots uh, are usually not dangerous until the last period of the pregnancy, but in the last period, due to the movement of the babies and also during birth, uh, the pulling of, this, uh, of the umbilical cord may tighten this knot and may stop the blood supply of the baby. This might lead to a dangerous situation, so then the, uh, the birth uh, must be very quickly finished uh, in order to let the baby breathe on its own and get, get its own oxygen supply, not through the umbilical cord. And a few years ago, I got an interesting picture from a young colleague uh, who was present at this birth, and there were two two true umbilical knot, uh, knot, uh, cord knots on the, on the umbilical cord, and the father asked whether the, uh, the doctor uh, made these knots onto the umbilical cord, and then she told that, of course, they don't deal with making knots on the umbilical cord. 
but this is very rare and the baby had luck because the baby was born uh, healthily and had no problems. This is how the umbilicus looks right after birth. This is right after birth. There you see uh, the surface epithelium, stratified squamous keratinizing epithelium, and with a sharp line, it goes over to the surface of the umbilical cord, which is covered by amnion. You know inside it is filled by the Wharton's jelly, and it contains the umbilical vessels. And from the lecture where we told about the flexion, uh, I hope that you remember that this line originates from here, from the edge of the trilaminar germ disk, because this was the territory where the ectoderm was continuous with the amnion. After birth, uh, they, it's tied down close to the uh, belly surface, uh, usually with a clip, it's clipped down, and then it mummifies, it dries out very quickly because this surface epithelium, this simple layer, doesn't, uh, doesn't prevent the evaporation. And you know that the Wharton's jelly is a ground substance rich connective tissue, so it dries out, mummificates, and usually it falls off spontaneously on the second week. Let's summarize that what are the main characteristics of the human placenta. The shape is discoid. We have the villi. We have the villi. It is hemochorial. The term hemo refers to that, that the maternal blood is in direct contact with the chorionic plate. So that's why it's hemochorial. Here you have the maternal blood, and from the chorionic plate, the villi are hanging down. And this is here the syncytial trophoblast, cytotrophoblast, and chorionic mesoderm. Allantochorial. Uh, we call it allantochorial. I explained you that what the allanto is, uh, is in birds. It has a big importance. And in human also the vessels form first like allantoic vessels, but soon they will turn into, uh, into the umbilical vessels. So that's why it is allantochorial, because the allantoic vessels precede uh, the, uh, the umbilical vessels and they connect to the chorionic plate. And it's decidual because the uterine mucosa, uh, the, the uh, decidual layer of the uterine mucosa will be also shed uh, during uh, delivery. Uh, we humans have a tendency to imagine everything like Everything should be like humans do it, but it's not, not even uh, with mammalians. Uh, Hemochorial placenta is typical for humans and for rat and rabbit. But there are other possibilities, like for cats and dogs, there is the so-called endotheliochorial placenta. That means that they form the uh, regular chorionic villi, but they are not floating in the freely flowing maternal blood, but the maternal blood vessel system is also closed, and they are attached to the surface of this chorionic villi. Uh, the next phase, even more simple, is the syndesmochorial, that's in ruminants like sheep and cow. Uh, there, a part of the glands is remaining, and to the external surface of this glandular epithelium, uh, the maternal vessels contact, so here the diffusion has to go through more layers. And if in case uh, this, uh, uh, these glands remain fully, then we get here the endotheliochorial uh, placenta, that's in pigs and horses. So in that case, the, uh, there is the uterine mucosa, and these would be here the glands, and the chorionic villi, they grow into these glands, and like you unplug it, it just disconnected during birth, and that's not followed by, by this uh, bleeding-like uh, like, uh, uh, removal of the lochia, like by humans. So there are also other possibilities. Of course, these variants, is, I'm, I'm showing only just for uh, showing something interesting. You must know the structure of the human placenta also only. And thank you for your attention, and see you in the next lecture.